space. But who? Third. We're here with Sean David Morton, best-selling novelist in regards to phenomenon, UFOs right now, Sands of Time bestseller. We're going to be getting into questions in regards to UFOs, Area 51. First of all, is Area 51 active? as we speak. Uh, it's active now, but it's active mostly for uh, top secret aircraft, ramjet, scramjet stuff. It's all pretty advanced, but the, the famous nine flying saucers that were there that were transported from uh, Wright-Patterson, the famous Hangar 18 in Wright-Patterson, Ohio, uh, those, those all got moved to Utah, to a place called Area 6413, which is in the middle of the, the, the what they call the Dugway Proving Ground. And it's all surrounded by uh, biological toxic chemical sites you know they put like dead cattle and signs that say nerve gas and all that so that's where most of the uh, most of that stuff is and as a matter of fact the majority of the uh, uh, well the majority of the space command stuff they, they used to have they had NORAD which used to be in Cheyenne Mountain that they moved to Colorado Springs and now they're moving NORAD back into Cheyenne Mountain because they're afraid of an electromagnetic pulse which is very strange so everything is moving back into back into Cheyenne Mountain and, um, but the main facility is actually underneath, uh, uh, this is the super top secret base, which is underneath the uh, uh, King's Peak in the Uinta National Forest in uh, Utah, which is where they now, they now have the, the real U.S. Space Command, the, the U.S. Space Command that's uh, coordinating activities throughout the solar system. So for protection of Earth from whatever they think is out there. So as far as relocation of Area 51, did they you know, bring this flying saucers to this new location, fly them there? How do they, you know, logistically get and relocate this uh, top secret? There was, there was an order that was made by uh, a, a gentleman that, that gave me the notes to write my book, uh, Santa Time. And they just, they didn't know what to do with them because they couldn't work them, they couldn't even open them. So that's why they shipped them there, I think in about, uh, when was it? Um, 86, I think it was. Might have been a little bit, a little bit sooner than that. But it was like it was about 86 or 87 or so, where they had the nine craft, and at Area 51, they actually figured out how to open them, and how to fly them, how to pilot them. And uh, strangely enough, they they couldn't figure it out because nobody had the guts to just get in one of the ships and actually sit in the seat. And they found that when you sat in the seat, the seat would would kind of poof up around you like a beanbag chair, if you will. And uh, that's what actually then triggered the mechanisms to turn on the uh, to turn on the consoles and make it work. But the biggest thing they were they were they were interested in was not so much the propulsion system or even the anti gravity stuff inside the ships. They were interested in the time travel aspect aspect of it because the ships the ships could actually actually expand and dilate time. That was the biggest thing because uh, people would get in the ships, they would spend. I don't know, an hour flying around and come back and there'd be 22 hours uh, hours on the clocks. So it all became a, a, a relative time-based thing. So that's what they were the most interested in was how do these craft and these ships actually dilate time? Because that's that was our biggest goal over the last 40 years was the ability to somehow manipulate and possibly shift or change time. That's what they think is going to be the... Uh, uh, that's going to be the atom bomb against the uh, against the Japanese, if you will, as far as the as far as what they believe is an extraterrestrial threat. Absolutely uh, incredible testimony right here. We have Dr. J. Andy Elias on location. He's going to get some questions in to Sean David Morton here. Let's get to it. Sean, I got a big question for you. Okay. Uh, you know, everyone talks about the reverse engineering, the reverse technologies, right. and Wright-Patterson was supposedly the place where everything went to uh, from Area 51. What do you think about that theory? Well, it went back the other way. Uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio was where uh, it, was, it was a, a repository for what was going on with Project Pounce. And Project Pounce was, every time there was a crash, any time there was anything extraterrestrial that they thought uh, was going on, they would send the Pounce teams out to recover and retrieve. And that really kind of started with, uh, with the Roswell crash in 47. So they had the nine ships that were either shot down or gotten in some kind of deal. And then at Area 51, they needed to study those ships. So they actually had them all shipped from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base into Area 51. Now, eventually, after they were uh, uh, doing their research on them, they actually built a special hangar that was just over the hill from uh, what they call 5-1 uh, near Papoose Lake, which is just in a pass the other side, which is an area called S-4. And S-4 was where they actually built a hangar into the side of the mountain 
and then uh, there were five levels going down underneath it, which included the top level being the, the saucers and ships, uh, uh, scientist offices on the second level, security on the third, uh, fourth, and then the fifth level was uh, what they called the ambassadorial suites, where they actually had uh, uh, various races and species of ET bodies, and supposedly the uh, uh, two captured aliens actually from a crash in the Kalahari, and you can actually see that. Uh, yeah, I actually worked on part of that, which is called the alien interview, and it was uh, it was two minutes and fifty five seconds that a guy named Victor actually pulled out of uh, out of five one, and and it stood the t it stood the test of time. It's almost been seventeen years after that. No one's come out and said they faked it. No one's taken credit for it. And the more we study that that footage, uh, the more we find that it's uh, it's realistic. So the other question, I think you have. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, first of all, about the newer okay, stuff. The fact that Area 51 is now acknowledged by the government, right. I don't, don't think anything there is anymore. Just like you said earlier, right? It's all top secret. It's but, it's more it's more ramjet scramjet technology. They, but even the even the mundane stuff is getting so advanced now. So for example, they. They've, they've, they've done away with the SR-71 Blackbird. They never replaced it with anything. Then you had the Aurora Project, which was a plutonium-pulsed pellet drive that led the famous, uh, left the famous donuts on a rope contrail. Uh, they had something called the Pumpkin Seed, which created a series of sonic booms and then would surf the, the shock wave. And uh, now they've got stuff like the TR-3B Astra. And the TR-3B Astra takes eight men to pilot. And in the center of the, of the Astra is uh, it's a quantum field drive. It allows the uh, it allows the ship to actually create a field around the craft and then bend space time for it to jump or teleport actually from one place to another. Uh, let me ask you about Dulce. A lot of people okay. talk about Dulce having seven levels, different ETs Correct. living there. Yes. You know, what do you know about that? Do you think I that's know, an active base? I know everything about that. Uh, I'm probably one of the foremost experts on the Dulce Mesa because uh, Dulce, which is in northern New Mexico, it's just south of Durango, Colorado. In 1989, I was part of a scientific team that actually went and sounded the base. We kind of took up a bet, really. There was a UFO investigator who was saying that he made up Dulce and the whole thing was fake, and that he just released it into the UFO community to show them, oh, UFO investigators are stupid because, look, I just made up this whole thing. We took offense to that. So myself, uh, Dr. Fred Bell, uh, the late Dr. Fred Bell, Dr. Jim Delatoso, uh, Paul Shepard, Joe Randazzo, and a group of us went to Dulce, and Dr. Delatoso had actually come up with a, a what he called a data tabling, which is for uh, deep underground sensing radar. He pioneered this. So we sounded the mountain, and then took slices of sound data, pounding it into the mountain, then put them all together like a loaf of bread, like slices on a loaf of bread, with a Cray supercomputer at, uh, at the University of San Diego. And we proved that the base was there. Actually physically proved, I've got the tape, I've got the whole thing. It's got an atomic reactor at the center. Uh, you can see the various levels actually on the, uh, uh, for, for all intents and purposes, a sonogram, literally, literally like a radar image. And, um, uh, but you can also see, the more interesting part about this is you can actually see the jet tubes underneath because there's things actually coming and going in the bottom. And that's, that's what triggered what we call the Dulce War. Dulce is key to everything that's going on in the background because Dulce was the place where the government's entire plan with the extraterrestrials went completely off the rails. We discovered that they weren't doing what they said they were doing. We discovered that they were actively harming people. Uh, and here's how it goes. There was a group of what they call the mole men coming up underneath that were actually completing this tunnel to run what they called the, the red line, which runs east-west and the blue line, which runs north-south, I believe. And as they came into this, uh, there was a conflict under, underground. So if somebody got shot in the hand, uh, testimony by Phil Schneider, for example, who was killed and uh, he was murdered in February 96. But uh, uh, that what started the, a, a Dulce conflict because then we sent another team down there and we found that there were, there were the bones of, of tens of thousands of human beings. Like, literally bleached, like they'd taken all these people and they weren't abducting them to do genetic experiments on them or collect uh, <laughs> sperm and eggs. They were actually boiling them down into soup for some kind of future invasion. And that's what then triggered Reagan uh, to then give the okay for what became known as the, as the Dulce War to actually clean out the facility. There was a conflict that happened in 77 in which four guys died, two Secret Service men, which I'm not gonna explain, but uh, four of our guys died, uh, which was the first big conflict. And then we went in and cleared out the base uh, somewhere around, like I said, it was about 86 or so. But by 89, when we were there, uh, either it was still active, but one way or another, that nuclear pile was still functioning underneath, and it was putting out a frequency of 440, 440 hertz, which is which is military standard. So it was doing something. Now, after we sounded the base, there were there were two unusual sightings over Dulce. Um, within 
in, in January, the first week of January, there was a big green glowing ball that was actually reported by the Apaches there that then swept west across the western United States. Actually, right from here, you can see where it went. It actually went over through the sky, went the other side of Catalina, which is right there, and ah. took a left turn. Now, my, I had a roommate at the time that came in and told me about this, and we saw it in the newspaper the next day because he was out scuba diving out there. Then, a few days later, another green ball came up out of the facility and went over the eastern United States, which is actually then reported in the, in the news. And as far as I know, uh, there hasn't been any real activity around Dulce since then. But as I said, Dulce was the key because that was where we actually gave under what was known as the Project Sigma Treaty that we signed in 64. That's where we actually then gave them uh, the lower levels of the facility. So we didn't really even know what was going on be below what's called Green Level 4 of, uh, of Dulce until, the, uh, until that conflict broke out. Final question for you. You just pointed to Catalina. Right Catalina. here, Catalina. supposedly yeah. there's bases underground. Yeah. A lot of people see yeah. craft coming from out of the water, going yes. up into the sky. Yes. What do you know about these USOs and the supposed base in Malibu and in the Catalina Channel? Um, okay, well, you can actually, the base in Malibu was just revealed. I mean, I've been telling people this for years. And back in, uh, in the Area 51 days, between 91 and 93, we heard about this and we would go, actually you can see it right there at Portuguese Bend, right there where Marineland used to be. Yeah. That's a big Trump resort. But it was, there was nothing there back in that days. And we would sit out there and we would see these blue disks actually glowing in the water between here and Catalina. Now, there's a reason, for example, why our government will not allow supersonic air travel to Hawaii or Japan over the South Pacific because we have so much stuff in the South Pacific. Like for example, the SST supersonic transport, why did it only fly to Paris? Why didn't it fly to Hawaii. Japan or Hawaii yeah. or, some, or someplace else? Because we have so much stuff in the South Pacific that we didn't want anything that looked like a sonic missile that they might, uh, that they might blow up. Now, you can see underneath Malibu, now on the other side of this you have, well, way up the coast a bit, you've got Vandenberg Air Force Base, but here you've got uh, Point Wanimi, uh -huh. and then you've got Point Magoo here. Point Magoo is where they launch the uh, the white tanker jets to uh, to chemtrail this entire really? area. So you'll see the chemtrails out within the next couple of days here. There's one there, there's more there, because they always come right before it's gonna rain or when it's when it's gonna be foggy. Here comes one now, here comes, <laughs> here comes the helicopter. Uh, but right underneath the hills, all through here, you can actually see on Google Maps, you can actually see how this underground base has actually been mounted uh, underneath the cliffs over in Malibu. Now, from the other side of Catalina, which is right behind us, uh, yeah, all that right stuff there. over Skull Island, and they sank Skull Island a while ago, but that's a gigantic naval testing ground there. Now, I spoke to uh, a top-level military guy who was, uh, who was working with what they call SYNCPAC in, uh, in the Vietnam War. And his claim was back in 19, he had a couple of interesting stories. Number one, he was at Area 51 where he saw a, uh, you know, a, a huge, it look, he said it looked like an SR-71, but it had a skin on it that felt like a dolphin. Uh -huh. And he was being told that this, this had extra solar capabilities. In other words, the ability to go out to the edge of the solar system and come back. The other thing that he did was that he claimed that he went from uh, a naval base here in Long Beach, actually, and that he got on a submarine and that submarine actually went through a series of underground aqueducts and that he actually came up in Kirtland, New Mexico, at the Kirtland, at Kirtland uh, Air Force Base in New Mexico, going underwater, underground, through a series of tunnels and aqueducts that were built uh, underneath the California, the California shelf. So, Dr. Sean David Morton, lots of information, incredible insight, things I've never heard before right here at Third Phase of Moon. You know, I got one big question for you. Okay. Do you think the government's ever going to reveal what's going on? Well, it's going to come to a point where they're going to have to. Uh, you'll notice how the government responses have changed over the past 70 years, where they've gone from uh, UFOs don't exist to UFOs aren't dangerous, but people who see them are and should be horsewhipped, as the Condon report said, to then uh, now they're, they're going to, we can either confirm or deny. The challenge here might be is that there are no UFOs, they're all IFOs. They know exactly what they are and where they're coming from. So they are telling the truth, saying there are no UFOs. The challenge with any of these governments is what's once a govern, govern and mint means control of the mind. So, you know, mind, <laughs> mint means mind, actually. So it's all control of the mind. And they've really painted themselves into a corner with all this information. If the government came out tomorrow, if Obama really came out tomorrow and said, yes, there are extraterrestrials and you know, peeled off his face and said, humans are tasty, uh, which is probably, you know, he's already an illegal alien, why not an extraterrestrial? Uh, would you believe him is the challenge. And the big, the other challenge would be, uh, 
uh, until they fill the skies, or and I'm sure they could they could they could play it off all kinds of different ways. Uh, again, they believe that the minute you admit to this, once again you destroy religions. You possibly destroy once you introduce the technology, you destroy the economic fabric, you destroy uh, the socio political fabric. But we are close to it. It's the biggest thing is the internet's gotten out of the box, and right. that has become the new sphere or the seventh chak the seventh chakra of the planet really. And that free and open exchange of information is preparing everybody for what's coming. Now, then, so that's that's my that's my question. That they will have no choice at some point, uh, but they can ignore it and stick their head in the sand as, as for as long as they can. Freedom of information is happening right now around the world. How will uh, people from watching right here at Third Phase of the Moon to listen to you? How do they get in contact with you? Uh, they can actually listen to my show. Go to my website www strangeuniverseradio.com. I was one of the original producers on Strange Universe, the TV series back in the 90s. Strangeuniverseradio.com, which is on revolutionradio.rocks. And uh, so there you go. That's, uh, that's how you get in touch with me. Or seandavidmorton.com as well. Sean, appreciate okay. you joining us you. right here at Thank Third you. Phase of Moon. And don't forget to listen to drjradiolive.com. Incredible insight there as well. And if you captured anything amazing in regards to UFOs, Please. you have information that you want to get out. Share it with the world right here at Third Phase of Moon. Blake Cousins. We'll see you again next time. Sean, let's, uh, you know. Third Phase of Moon.